So welcome to this uh, webinar where we commemorate the International Day for Biodiversity. Um, it's the first time that uh, uh, this joint venture of the Social Apostolate and Jesuit Institute hosts the webinar this time of the day. Normally it's evening time. So um, we welcome you and thank, thank you for your time. So as you know, this year's uh, today, the 22nd of May, it's the International Day for Biodiversity, which is uh, celebrated worldwide. It's uh, the universal observance and the commemoration of the Convention on Biological Diversity, which was adopted on the 22nd of May, 1992. So this is an opportunity to highlight the problem of, uh, I mean, to highlight the importance first of biodiversity and uh, the challenges that are facing biodiversity. And Pope Francis in his uh, letter, Laura to see, you will remember that uh, this day comes in the middle of uh, Laura to see week. And Pope Francis in, the, in his uh, encyclical Laura to see, he has a, a few points that he mentions or he alludes to uh, regarding biodiversity. So this day, as I said, it's uh, the 22nd of May, to commemorate the Convention of Biological Diversity since 1992. It provides us with that opportunity to uh, um, be aware and uh, to raise awareness about the importance of, of biodiversity. This year's theme, be part, of, be part of the plan. So it's the theme for this International uh, Day for Biodiversity and it's a call uh, to action for all stakeholders to hold and reverse the loss of biodiversity by supporting and, and by supporting the implementation of the coming Montreal uh, Global Diversity Framework and also referred to as the Biodiversity Plan. So according to the uh, Biodiversity Convention, uh, this this is the day when uh, we highlight this challenge. So we have uh, Father Peter Knox, who will be leading this discussion, and uh, basically informing us more about uh, biodiversity. Father Peter Knox uh, from Johannesburg, based in Johannesburg at the Jesuit Institute at the moment, and uh, he he born and bred uh, Johannesburg. He studied, uh, he did his high school here in Johannesburg and finished. Uh, after that, he went to UCT to study chemist, maths and chemistry. He worked uh, in the industrial chemistry, in industrial chemistry, and he says he hated it. <laughs> he has studied philosophy, theology, and education in Birmingham, London, Peter Maritzburg, and Ottawa where he did his PhD in systematic and historical theology on AIDS, ancestors, and salvation. He has worked in parishes in Soweto, Bramfontein, and Ottawa as well. He taught maths science in England, in Nyanga, Cape Town. He taught theology at John Vianney Sem National Seminary in Pretoria here in South Africa, and the St. Augustine College in Johannesburg. He has run the Archdiocese and the Johannesburg Archdiocese and School of Theology, where men, uh, 65 men, were studying towards becoming permanent deacons. He has spent 10 years, 10 and a half years in Nairobi teaching at, at theology and environmental ethics at the Jesuit School of Theology in uh, at Hakima. Um, he was dean of the School of uh, of a school, he was the dean of a school and faculty of theology, as well as deputy principal for the academic affairs of Hakima. Since June, he works with the Jesuit Institute. June last year, of course, he works with the Jesuit Institute and spends a lot of time uh, writing. His passion on environmental theology began uh, some time before I had to see, and has spent the last eight years or so popularizing the message of the encyclical. So for the Knox, thank you so much for your time and uh, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Slobo. 
it's a pleasure to be addressing this topic with you today. It's a pleasure that we have the opportunity to kind of bring to mind the importance of biodiversity. If you look at the, the little logo on the right-hand side of your screen, it shows that the Jesuit Institute in South Africa and the Jesuits of the Southern African province want to be part of the plan. We want to be involved in um, safeguarding biodiversity, or in other words, making sure that biodiversity risks are reduced. If you look at the picture on the left-hand side of this, of this screen, you can see a number of species of animals which are really on the brink of extinction. Giraffes, as we know uh, in Africa, uh, there are various bird species like condors in South America, tigers of various species. There are several species of tiger, and they're all on the brink of extinction. And you see some of them have already leapt off the earth. And then you have some, some other species of animals in different parts of the world, which are really, really struggling to survive. You've got the Asian elephant. You can see that's an Asian elephant, not an African elephant, which is also critically endangered. And so we want to reflect on biological diversity today, just for, just for this coming hour, and know what it is that we're talking about and what we can do to be part of the plan, to be part of the, the salvation, possibly, of biological diversity. Firstly, let's start with a definition. What do we mean when we talk of biological diversity? If we read the first chapter of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, we read about God creating an enormous, um, an enormous amount of life. God created all the plants and the animals. God created everything that exists. God put the earth in its place. God created the conditions for rain, for sunshine, for absolutely everything. And over the billions of years, we think that creation has taken 13 billion years and life only emerged on the planet Earth about three and a half billion years ago. And during that, during the past three and a half billion years, a whole variety of life has evolved. Um, some people don't like the theory, theory of evolution, but let me take that as presumed. Theories, species of plants and animals and bacteria, species, human species, or pre-human species evolved and evolved and evolved till we got to the situation where we are today over billions of years. There are approximately 8.7 million species of plant and animal and bacteria and micro, microbiological organisms. There are all sorts of organisms that we've never ever heard about, we haven't possibly imagined, we haven't discovered them, or science hasn't identified and described them yet. Scientists have only described 1.2 million of the 8.7 million species. How a species comes is that it evolves and it, it develops from previous species when it's better suited to survive in a particular niche. If it's better suited to consume the food that's available, if it's better suited to kind of overcome anything that might want to consume it, so we've heard of survival of the fittest that doesn't only apply in politics or in kind of in our local societies and things like that. Survival of the fittest is really what helps species to survive. The strongest species for a particular environment survives best. Different species can't interbreed. So maybe a couple of species might be able to produce an offspring, but that offspring is, is biologically um, is, is unable to re reproduce itself. It's, it's not fertile. It can't have more of the same species. For example, a horse and a donkey may reproduce, and they will produce a mule, but a mule itself can't produce more mules. A mule is um, sexually unable to create more mules. So species cannot interbreed and then produce more and more species of the same of, of the same kind of product of those species. When we talk about biological diversity in particular, we're referring to regions, we're referring to ecosystems, we're referring to the entire planet, 
or we were referring to individual species in a very, very small place, like a fish, like a pond that arises after rain. You can talk about the diversity of all the living organisms inside a pond after the rain. So biological diversity has a number of meanings, and we have to be aware all the time of the scale that we're talking about. Species produce a web of life. Species don't just live in isolation, in silos, separate from each other. I'm just giving us the example of the African savanna, and you've got all these species. I've got like um, one, two, three, four, five, six species of mammals. We've got the zebras, we've got the wildebeest, we've got the cheetah, we've got the lions, we've got the elephants, we've got the giraffes, we've got buffaloes, perhaps that's a buffalo there, many, many species of mammals. We've got bird species. There's a secretary bird up there. There's a an ostrich staring straight out of the page at us. We've got the various plants, which are primary producers. They convert energy from the sun into consumable energy, consumable material for all the other species, which also become consumable material for the species which are higher up on the food chain. So we've got grasshoppers, for example, which consume the which consume the plant. We've got the herbivores like the gazelles and the zebras and the wildebeest that will consume the grass. We've got the elephant consuming the bark of the baobab tree. We've got the giraffe consuming the leaves of the acacia tree. And so, so you've got the primary producers, you've got the primary consumers, and we've got secondary consumers as well. Those are the carnivores, the the um, the cheetah and the lions, they consume, we've got, um, we've got eagles, for example, or harrier eagles, they're also consumers, they'll consume the smaller mammals, maybe some of the insects. And then once the consumers, primary and secondary consumers have kind of left their, have died, or they have kind of left their feces behind, that is then reconverted into um, biologically available material for the primary producers, the grass, the trees, whatever. So we've got dung beetles, which will bury dung. We've got bacteria, we've got fungi, which convert the, which convert the dead material into material which is available to be, uh, to be re-consumed re by the grass and the trees and whatever. So there's a whole web of species, there's a whole web of life. We don't think of ourselves, even as human beings, existing in splendid isolation. We depend on the species, the producers, the primary producers, the secondary producers. We ourselves, when we die, we're going to be, we'll return to dust from which we came. And that dust will then be usable by other species that will come, that will sort of inhabit our graves. And so, we think of a whole web of life. Some parts of the world are very, very intense and very, very important for, um, for bio, biodiversity, biological diversity. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature has identified 36 regions of life, in, intense life um, regions, they call them biogeographic regions. They're of exceptional value because they have very many species living there, and they provide irreplaceable ecological services, like they purify water, or they make sure that the, the waves of the ocean don't um, crash into, into the land. They filter out carbon dioxide and they produce oxygen when we think of the algae or when we think of the, of the forests of the earth. So those are called ecological services, and these biogeographical regions can contain a very, very high number of endemic species or a high number of endangered species. And so these biological, these biodiversity hotspots are the ones that kind of attract funding and they attract interest from people all over the world. And by the way, the African savannas are one of those. For example, for example, uh, you have hundreds of species, some of them invisible to the eye, living on the savannas. The island of Madagascar is also a biodiversity hotspot. Remember, it's separated from Africa over millions of years. It's drifted away from continental Africa. 
you can see how Madagascar fits into like a jigsaw puzzle. It fits into the coast of, of Mozambique, but it's drifted away from Mozambique. And the species on Madagascar have evolved separately from the, from the species of Africa. So you've got entire taxa, entire groups of animals, for example, the lemurs, for example, some birds, some plants, which are found only in Madagascar and nowhere else in the world. So Madagascar is a biodiversity hotspot. These hotspots cover about two and a half percent of the Earth's surface. They're home to about two billion people. So that's about one third of the, of the human population live in these biodiversity hotspots. And they contain about 50% of the endemic species, that is species which occur only in that particular space and nowhere else in the world. Biodiversity hotspots have more than two thirds of their species under threat, under risk of extinction. Because they're very, very small areas, a change to a small area, if we think of the Amazon forest, for example, or the forest of the Congo basin, if you lose a couple of hectares, hundreds of hectares, you might lose an entire species. So as foresters come in and they chop down trees, we may be losing species that have not even been described and that may be important or that are potentially important for human health and safety. Um, the forests are the lungs of the earth. Um, the Cape Floral Kingdom, so where Father Rampe lived before he came to before he came back to Johannesburg, the Cape Floral Kingdom has 6,000 species of plants. If you read the newspaper today, you'll read that at the Chelsea Flower Show, they put out 22,000 cuttings of the, of the Cape Floral Kingdom. So the South African display at the Chelsea Flower, Flower Show in London won three gold medals because it was representing this floral kingdom, which is such an enormous hotspot of biodiversity. There are birds which occur in the Cape Floral Kingdom and nowhere else. And that's a tiny little area around the southern coast of Africa. Um, there are important birding areas. If birds are migrating or if birds are breeding, there are places where some birds will breed and nowhere else in the world. We've spoken about mangroves, we've spoken about savannas. So let's move on from biodiversity hotspots. This map shows us 36 biodiversity hotspots around the world. And these hotspots have been receiving funding from the United Nations and from, from NGOs just to preserve the uniqueness of the life in these places. Um, why is there a concern for biodiversity? What's the big, what's the big hassle? Why are people suddenly talking about biodiversity? Why is there a biodiversity day? What's today all about? There's the growing recognition that human activity is modifying the planet, that humans are changing the world in ways that it's never been seen before, it's never been, so it's never been possible before. Really since the industrial age began in the middle of the 19th century, human activity is expanding like nothing before. Um, human activity is causing climate change. I take that as a given. I don't, I don't dispute that, and most people don't dispute that anymore. Human activity is causing the acidification of the oceans, which is causing, um, which makes the oceans too acidic for various species of corals to survive. Human resource extraction, mining, or chopping down forests, or taking, taking animals out of their places, and that's called resource extraction. Either minerals or, or living resources are sort of cutting back the number of species that are able to survive. There's deforestation. We're cutting down forests in order to make um, agricultural land. We're cutting down forests because people want timber. Very often the timber is exported to, to other continents. Um, industries are growing and growing and growing and sometimes causing a fair amount of harm to through air pollution, for example. And so human activity is really destroying all sorts of ecosystems. And so the so the um, so the, the the species that live in those ecosystems are being threatened and eventually cannot survive in their particular niche. Remember, a species needs a very specific place in order to survive. 
And since all the species are interdependent, the loss of one or more species undermines the survival of all the other species in that ecosystem, in that region or on that planet. So the International Union for the Conservation of Nature has done um, an assessment of some 52,000 species of these are animals that we can recognize. These are vertebrates, for example, the mammals, the amphibians, the birds. They've looked at those species and they have the species in black. That's 85% of the mammals, for example. 85% of the mammals are safe and 85% have, have no threat against them. But 25% are threatened in one way or another. Okay, so the black ones are not threatened, are threatened. The 25% are under some kind of threat with amphibians, that's frogs and salamanders and things. 70% have been assessed of all the animals there have been assessed and 41% of them are under threat. With birds, 13% of the bird species are under threat. If we look at smaller animals or animals that we don't encounter every day, we look at reptiles, um, 772 species are under threat. And so it goes wrong with all the, all the kind of lower, if we may call them that, animal species and plant species. Many, many, many of them are under threat. And so that's, that, that's a cause for concern for us. There are predictions that in the next 10 years, a million species may die out. And that's, that's a major cause of concern. A recent survey has been done, so that was last month in South Africa, a recent survey has been done, and they've looked at various different ta taxa, that's various different um, groups of animals, and they've looked at amphibians, reptiles, fish, that is lionfish, fish that get caught for food, for example, um, fish that are not caught for food, um, birds, mammals, freshwater fish, sharks, et cetera, et cetera. And they're giving the number of species in South Africa of each of these, of each of these um, groups. And they're saying how many of them are under threat. And there's a color code along the bottom here. Um, some, which are, some species which are already extinct, other species which are regionally extinct, that are extinct in a particular region, some species which are possibly extinct because we can't find any remnants of that species. Some species which are criti critically endangered, others which are endangered, others which are vulnerable, others which are near threatened but not under great threat. There's some species for which there's not sufficient information. We don't have enough data. Some species, for example, some species of aloes are rare because they only occur in a particular area. Um, and there's some species which are of, of least concern. And those are, the, those are the ones here with this greenish color, that gray green color, um, which, that gray green color, which is, oh, let me just go back to that slide. My computer has a skill of advancing itself. So species with this gray green color are of least concern. And so this is South Africa. And I'm sure whatever country you come from, your scientists and your biologists and your citizen scientists are doing similar um, assessments of the biodiversity in your country and the threats to biodiversity. In the World Economic Forum, which took place a couple of months ago in Davos in Switzerland, as it always takes place, the Global Risks Report cited the loss of biodiversity and the collapse of various ecosystems as major threats to the world. They said by the year 2035, this will be the third biggest threat. Maybe we can think of climate change as the biggest threat. Maybe we can think of um, migration or wars as the second biggest threat. The third biggest threat will be biodiversity um, loss and ecosystem collapse. The, the World Economic Forum estimates that about half of the GDP, the gross domestic product of the world, or of 44 trillion US dollars, is de dependent on nature. So if nature is kind of collapsing, then the GDP of the world is going to collapse. 
commensurately. If species are being used or utilized to the point of extinction, then those species will no longer be able to support the economy which is based on them. They reckon, so that is the World Economic Forum reckons, that a million species, as I've said, are at risk of extinction in the coming decades. Uh, a text from the World Economic Forum, I just have to close the window here because there's too much noise coming in. A text from the World Economic Forum website says, we have the power to change this. Humanity urgently needs to rethink its relationship with nature in order to halt and or reverse the alarming degradation of the natural world. Business leaders have to play a crucial role in this. They must put nature at the core of their processes, at the core of their decision making. So if it's kind of, if it's hard nosed economists looking at the world and they're not sort of bunny huggers like me and possibly you, they're not people who sort of in love with nature for the sake of it or for the theology of it. They're saying, here's the economy of the world. It depends on, at least 50% of it depends on uh, natural, natural um, resources in one way or another. So nature is like a web. Biodiversity is like a web. If we tickle one little part of that web, if we kind of mess around with one little dot, one little species in the web, if we say mess around with, if we mess around with this little dot, which may represent one particular species in a web of reactions, in a web of dependency, if we remove this web here, then, or this little species here, then the entire lines that are dependent on it will also collapse. And that may have repercussions way over on the other side of the web of life. And we haven't a clue. There may be a particular kind of um, bacterium which depends entirely on this, um, this, little, this little species here, a species of plant or a species of animal. And this bacterium over here depends on that for its survival. And so we haven't a clue really of all of the relationships and the intricacies of relationships that keep life going on Earth. We have to remember that humans are part of the ecosystem. We are part of the whole web of life. This is a photograph taken from Sud, the Sud wetlands in South Sudan. All these little brown patches you see are villages. And each village is dependent on the entire ecosystem. The people here obviously survive on fish, mostly that's their source of protein. And we are part of our ecosystem. We depend on our ecosystem for life. That's not the only reason obviously to keep the ecosystems alive and flourishing. Ecosystems are a reflection of God's greatness, God's creativity, God's immensity. Um, they're, their reflections on, on what God has given to the world. And so we, as part of our ecosystem, should live in balance with our ecosystem. Here's a quotation from UNESCO, the head of UNESCO three or four years ago. Without biodiversity, there would be no life, there would be no beauty on this planet. Biodiversity is the living tissue of the earth. We are living tissue, we are part of biodiversity. And the health of the earth is in, intimately linked to human health. So if the earth is unhealthy, human beings are going to be unhealthy. We're part of the living tissue. So let's come a little bit closer to home and think what are the challenges of biodiversity in Africa? Um, habitat, habitats are being lost as villages grow, as cities grow, as kind of, as um, people start spreading their agricultural lands, habitats are being lost. Sometimes habitats are being fragmented. So you've got a bit of forest here, you've got a bit of forest here, but you've got a town in between. If you think of the of the Congo, the forest in the Congo River Basin, you've got towns kind of spreading and interrupting the continuity of various habitats. Um, some people overexploit. For example, traditional healers, they, they go out into nature, they collect bits and pieces, they collect specific species which have um, which have pharmacological value they prescribe these as medicines to their to their patients and they take some of these traditional medicines 
beyond the ability to support them. For example, people take traditional foods. If you've got 10 people depending on a population of bats or a population of chimpanzees for bushmeat, that's one thing. But if you've got 10,000 people depending on exactly the same population for their bushmeat, so okapis or whatever animals you choose to think of, then that bushmeat population is going to collapse. Some people take parts of animals or parts of plants for decor, to decorate their houses, to decorate their, person, their persons and clothing. And so if the nature is overexploited, then that will pose a challenge. That does pose a challenge to biodiversity. Climate change, anthropogenic climate change, is already making it very difficult for some species to survive. If it's too hot, if it's too dry, some species simply won't survive the climate change. Human populations, as they spread, the cities and towns have to spread as well. And so they'll spread into the easiest places to spread into, not into arid mountains, but they'll spread into, they do spread into savannas, for example. And so the savanna animals and plants there are, are challenged. A lot of chemicals are used. Africa uses a lot less, a lot fewer chemicals than other parts of the world for agriculture, but pesticides kill pests, what things are that, that are regarded as pests. But they also kill all sorts of other species, which are really important, like bees. Bees are the major, are the major pollinators of many, many plants. But if bees eat fertilizer, which has been put down to kill flies or slugs or something like that, the bees themselves are killed by those pesticides. Fertilizer flow into rivers, they flow into dams and things like that. And those are kind of poisonous and toxic. All they produce a bloom of, of um, a specific kind of, of um, plant. And that then kills the water, destroys the water quality for other plants. There are pandemics. We think of avian influenza. Birds are migrating up and down, north and south all the time. And birds are spreading diseases. I have a friend who's a vet in South Africa, and she's had to recommend that entire flocks of chickens, for example, chickens being farmed, they have to be euthanized because one or two of the birds have got avian influenza, and that can spread to all the other birds of that flock, thousands of birds. You can think of the loss of money, but you can think of the loss of life, thousands of birds being killed so that the influenza doesn't spread to human beings or to other, other species. Commercial hunting has wiped out elephant populations, lion populations, rhino populations in many parts of Africa. There are supposed to be conventions in place to govern hunting, but we know what corruption is like. We know that elephants, lions, lionos, whatever, big fauna, trophies, go out of this country, out of our countries, they leave the continent because our civil authorities aren't able to control commercial hunting. Population collapses, for example, because animals are not getting enough food. If we think of the commercial fisheries of, of Cape Town or the Western Cape, uh, so, much food, so much food is being taken out of the ocean that the African penguins, the only species of penguin uh, endemic to Africa, that population is collapsing because they're unable to find the food they need. And it's not just South African fishermen who are coming there into the South African waters to catch fish. It's fishermen from China, from Japan, from Spain, from other countries coming to fish in our waters. And so that then threatens the food supply of the African penguin, the only endemic penguin in the, in the continent. And then we have people who think it's cute to keep monkeys or to keep African parrots. And so those, those species are taken out of their homes. For example, you think of the African parrots in Congo and in the Congo basin, they're taken out of there. And ultimately the population's decline of endemic species, the African parrots or pangolins or, or various species of monkey, cute monkey or cheetahs, People want to keep them as pets in other parts of the world. And so those, those are challenges to the biodiversity. One thing we have to say is that a plantation is not a forest. I think we can see that, can't we? That there's a great difference between a plantation 
which is planted commercially, and a forest. A forest is just random. Nature grows forests over hundreds of years, hundreds of generations. Plantation is planted by human beings, and it's not the same as a forest. A plantation is a monoculture. It's a green desert. It's only, you've, you've only got one species, for example, eucalyptus or pine trees growing in a plantation. The canopy of a plantation, the, the leaves there at the top, prevent sunlight from penetrating all the way to the ground so that different species of plant can grow. Even if the seeds are there, very often different species of plant are unable to grow because the, the sunlight doesn't penetrate because the, the trees are grown so close together and they all grow at the same rate, at the same speed. And so the canopy is always kind of at an average, at an average height. Most often plantations are owned by corporations and those corporations are not growing forests or are not growing plantations for the good of the people who live in the area. A lot of the wood is exported from South Africa. A lot of our wood goes to China a lot of it has been used for paper. And it, when we had a very thriving mining economy, a lot of the wood was used for the support of mines. But nowadays in the South African economy, most of the wood grown in South Africa is exported. Monocultural forests like eucalyptus and pines use disproportionate amounts of land and water. They take so much land, which could be used for other, other species. It could be used for growing food crops, could be grasslands, it could be savannah. And a forest normally takes 30 years from the time it's planted to the time it's mature and ready for harvesting. You, there may be some faster growing forest with fast growing, fast growing timber, but normally 30 years is we have to say this land is not going to be available for 30 years because of the forest growing on it. Many forests are not employment intensive. The forestry companies want to use as much mechanized um, labor as possible. So they use tractors, they use chainsaws, they're not employing many, many people in the area of the plantation. And then ultimately, finally, when the, the wood is being used for the making of pulp and paper, a lot of chlorine is used to make the paper nice and white. And that chlorine flows into local water bodies. The chlorine isn't always contained in dams, it isn't always contained, it doesn't always evaporate. The chlorine destroys local water bodies. Let's just have a look at traditional medicine. In Zulu, we use the word multi, which is related to the word imiti, which is tree. And I'm sure in many of your own languages as well, multi relates somehow to tree. Um, so here's a, here's a quotation from a study published on traditional medicine by four doctors in South Africa looking at traditional medicine. The trade in traditional medicine in South Africa is estimated to be worth 2.9 billion rand per year. That's a lot of money, even in South African terms, and that was in 2007. This represents 5.6, almost 6% of the national health budget. There are about 27 million consumers of traditional medicine in South Africa. And so the trade is vibrant and the trade is widespread. In most towns, in most villages, certainly in every city, there's a market where people can go to get their traditional medicines. There are at least 133,000 people employed in the traditional medicine trade. And large percentage of the people who collect the, the traditional medicines are rural women. Then they, they hand them over to the traditional healers. The plant trade is a key rural industry and it's a business incubator. However, supply of the plant material, in South Africa about 771 different species are used and the supply of the medicines is not sustainable. Plants are normally harvested from the wild. They're not generally grown in plantations or something like that. So people go into the wild and they harvest wild um, examples, wild species. and some species have become locally extinct. And I'll show you an uh, infographic in a minute. And some species are traded at very high prices. And I'll show you some pictures about that in a minute as well. So the future of the traditional medicine trade and the benefits of the traditional medicine trade are not certain. 
on you let's just okay so so there's so traditional medicine is important but we have to see what they what what it's posing to the environment in addition to plant in addition to plant products in a traditional chemist shop in south africa in johannesburg you might find leopards paws lion's claws aardvark paws you may find parts of vultures or entire vultures or ground hornbills. These are large, slow growing animals which take decades before their reproductive cycle sort of goes in full circle. You'll find scales of crocodiles and pangolins and some reptiles. You'll find quills of porcupines. You'll find seashells, starfish, and corals all taken from the ocean. You'll find pieces of skin of elephants and you'll find entire python skins you'll find decoctions that is insects like beetles or something put into bottles and decocted say in alcohol or methylated spirits you'll find tortoise shells and you'll often find clothing which was traditionally reserved for royalty which is now being sought by everyone for example in south africa um an, a leopard skin was traditionally used by royalty but now everybody who, who thinks he's somebody or she's somebody wants to wear leopard skin. So while it used to be um, sustainable hundreds of years ago to take leopard skins for the king, now everybody wants to use one and leopards are under threat. As well as their, their um, habitat under, under threat, the animals themselves are under threat. In some parts of Africa, for example, Madagascar, Chameleons are used as part of traditional medicine. In some other parts of Africa, vultures are used as part of, med of medicine. So this photograph is taken from a medicine shop in Johannesburg, but it could equally have been taken in a medicine shop in Nigeria, because vultures are used in Nigeria as well. Um, this is scientific writing here, so a Western scientist, I'm afraid. Vultures have no medicinal value but they are sought after by traditional healers for belief-based uses, such as retrieving lost goods or stolen goods, bringing back lost lovers, acquiring intelligence or good fortune. Because vultures have such incredible sight, they're attributed with insight. And so if you eat the brain of a vulture, or if you take the claw of a vulture, you will get that sight and that insight which are, which are associated with vultures. Um, African traditional medicine, this is a photograph taken from Cotonou in Benin. African traditional medicine is very often plant-based. And so whatever the species of plant is on the left, you can just imagine if somebody goes into the wild and chops this, this bush and chops and chops and chops and chops to bring hundreds of kilograms into Cotonou, and this shop has it and the next shop has it and the next shop has it, you can just think of the threat to that species in, in Benin. Medicinal plants in South Africa, 88% of medicinal plants, so this is from a study in 2013, 88% um, pose no concern at all. 0.1%, that's one thousandth of the species in Africa, are one thousandth of the species in Africa, are ex in South Africa, are extinct. Um, 4% of the species are threatened. So one in every 25 species is threatened. 1.8% is near threatened. 1.7% is in decline. 1% is very rare. That's what, makes, that's what makes them sought after as traditional medicine. And so looking at the traditional medicine scene in South Africa, referring only to plants and not to animals, you can see that the harvesting of some species is not sustainable because because the species have either been become extinct or they're under great threat. So that's the medicinal species. Let's look at migratory species. Some animals need to migrate. If you think of elephants, they can't just be eating grass in the same patch or trees or leaves or bark in the same patch. Elephants are large animals. Zebras and wildebeest are large animals and they need to migrate. So we think of the great, great, the famous migration in the Maasai Mara um, biome in Kenya and Tanzania. In the Khalakhadi area, so in Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Angola, species migrate 
following the rains, following the plants that are, that are there. And so we need lots and lots of space for species to migrate. This is for megafauna, for, for large animals to migrate, but to get their grass. Birds also migrate thousands of kilometers. They're going for particular plant species. They're going for particular insects. In summertime in Africa, in the Southern Africa, there's an explosion of insect life and birds come sometimes seven or 8,000 kilometers just to feast on the, on the insects that, that we find here during our summer when in, northern, in the Northern hemisphere, it's freezing cold and they wouldn't survive. Sharks need to move around to find fish. Fish need to go to their breeding grounds. For example, we look at, think of the mangrove swamps on the, on the coast. Um, the ranges of many, many migratory species are fragmented, which means that the wild animals have to tra traverse areas which are populated by humans, and therefore they come into contact with human beings. In 2024, that is this year, the United Nations reported that almost half of the migratory creatures are in decline. 20% of migratory species could become extinct. Populations of fish, for example, migratory fish have declined 90% since 1970. So you think of societies which depend on fish for their, for their, for their uh, protein, for their, their food security. If 90% of their fish populations have, have declined, then what's gonna happen to those societies which depend on fish? This is just a, a very complicated graphic, but it's from the Convention for Migratory Species showing all the different threats to migratory species, climate change, um, agriculture, overexploitation, energy production, mining, transportation. There are lots and lots of threats which migratory species face and, they, and that goes on around the world. It's not just here in Africa. What does the church say? Let's look first at Pope Bartholomew or Patriarch Bartholomew. He's, he's quoted by Pope Francis in his encyclical on care for our common home. Patri Patriarch Bartholomew says it's a sin for us to destroy nature, to make life, um, to make life difficult for other species. Destruction of biological diversity of God's creation, uh, to degrade the integrity of the earth, to strip the earth of its natural forests, these are all sins, says Pope Bartholomew, Patriarch Bartholomew. It's a crime against the natural world, it's a crime against God, and it's a crime against ourselves. Pope Francis writes, he dedicates 11 paragraphs of Laudato Si, his encyclical from 2015, to biodiversity. 11 paragraphs, I'm just going to quote for you from paragraph 32 and 33, the first two of those 11 paragraphs. The Earth's resources are being plundered because of short-sighted approaches to the economy, to commerce and to production. The loss of forests and woodlands entails the loss of species which may constitute important resources for the future for human beings, not only for food, but also for medicines and for other uses. Different species contain genes which could be key resources in years ahead for meeting our human needs and for regulating environmental problems. And that's Laudato C number 32, Laudato C number 33. It's not enough to think of species simply as resources for us to exploit. We overlook the fact that they have value in themselves. Every year, we see the disappearance of thousands of plants and animal species, which we will never know, which we haven't even been discovered by science or recorded by science or described by science. Our children will never see these species because they've been lost forever. Once something is extinct, it's extinct forever. The great majority of species become extinct because of reasons associated with human activity, says Pope Francis. Because of us, thousands of species will no longer be there to give glory to God by their very existence. And they won't convey God's message to us through those species. Pope Francis says we have no right to be doing this. And so let's not end on a negative note. The theme for World Biodiversity Day today, Universal Biodiversity Day, is for us to be part of the plan. What can we do to make a difference? Firstly, we have to, every time we do something or we anticipate doing something which will have an effect on nature, we have to do 
an environmental impact assessment. We have to think of what are the consequences going to be. We have to take the precautionary approach, which is a very important approach in Catholic moral theology. We have to take the precautionary approach and say what are the consequences going to be, the effects on biodiversity, the effects on the water quality, the effects on the trees or the, the grasses that will be available for other animals. We have to hold our governments accountable. Many of our governments, all of our governments in Africa have signed several conventions on, they've made commitments on preservation of biodiversity, preservation of nature reserves. And yet we've seen our nature reserves slowly being encroached by human populations or by agriculture or by industry. And so we have to hold our governments responsible. They've undertaken on the international stage to preserve life, animal life on earth, and we have to make sure that they stick to their, their obligations. We have to know the reproductive cycle of species that we're exploiting, because if we're exploiting them, we have to do it in a sustainable way. How long, for example, does it take before it reaches sexual maturity? Elephants only reach sexual maturity in their 30s. They can only start, the males can only start reproducing in their 30s. So if we kill all the elephants under the age of 30, that'll be the end of that species. This is for the African, African plains elephant. Um, we have to be foresight. We have to have foresight. We have to think of our generations that are going to follow us. We're not kind of, we're not taking this space for ourselves and handing it on to the generations that will follow us. We're borrowing it from future generations. We're using this space at the, yeah, I mean, as, as a gift from the generations that are going to follow us. If we make a quick profit now, what implication is that going to have? for the generations that will follow us. If we destroy landscapes, for example, we permit mining in sensitive landscapes, our children will never see those landscapes in their original condition. We have to ask ourselves, is my traditional medicine sourced ethically? How is, where does it come from? If I go in looking for baboon's teeth or a baboon's skull at the local market, where did that come from? And are those baboons going to be threatened, their whole population be threatened because of the, the sourcing of those baboons for traditional medicine? The theme for um, Laudato Si Week for this year is to sow seeds of hope. But I don't think there's any value in us being all hopeful and happy clappy and saying, oh, the world is going to be fine. Hope is based on reality. Hope is based on real concrete evidence. Hope is based on what we are doing and what God is doing through us. So if we sow seeds of hope, we have to sow seeds of threatened species. We have, for example, plants. If we see plants that are threatened, we have to respect them. We have no right to be hopeful if we're doing nothing about it. We should support, I'm suggesting here, the South African National Biodiversity Institute, but if you're from Lesotho or Zambia or Malawi, wherever you are, you have to be supporting the biodiversity institutes in your own country. And then each of us can do this. Many of us are scared of the word science, but we should become citizen scientists. We should be reporting to authorities or to study groups or reporting to um, the Biodiversity Institute any species that we that we observe. For example, I do a fair amount of bird watching, not enough in my opinion. Um, I do a fair amount of bird watching. Every time I try to keep a list of the species I've seen, where I've seen them, sometimes what condition the birds were in, whether they were breeding, whether they were kind of in a very poor condition. And scientists use this information to build up a big, bigger picture, a larger picture of what's going on with biodiversity in those places where, where they've got information. CITES, which is the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species of Wildlife, Wild Fauna and Flora. CITES, like, like the other United Nations conventions, has the regular cycle of meetings every two or three years, and they update every two or three years all of their, their information. If you just look at this infographic, it comes from the CITES 
um, CITES uh, COP, that the, the gathering of all the parties of the CITES um, convention that was held in Panama City in 2022. And 562 species were added to the appendix two. That's 562 species of plants or animals were added to the list of endangered or critically endangered species. Um, and so that's two years ago. So the species which are going into danger or becoming endangered were, um, were kind of added to that list. All species were upgraded, so from vulnerable to critically endangered or from critically endangered to extinct or something like that. And six species at that COP meeting were downgraded, downlisted. So they went from almost extinct to safe or whatever. So they, they became safer, or it was recognized that they were safer. There are international conventions, and this is my second last slide, you'll be pleased to know. There are various international conventions regarding biodiversity. The very first one was in 1992, uh, that should be 1972, sorry, 1972 at the Rio Earth Summit. So that's been over 50 years, 150 nations signed um, the Convention on Bio Biological Diversity in 1972. And there are now 196 parties and 168 signatories in that convention. Um, Okay, so that's changed. Um, and so, so that, that convention is really important for biodiversity around the world. The third COP meeting of the Rio Convention produced the Nagoya Protocol. The ninth COP meeting of the Rio, Rio um, Convention on Biodiversity produced the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, how to keep animals and plants safe. Uh, two years ago, the 15th COP meeting on this convention produced the Kunming uh, framework, Kunming Montreal framework, which is trying to preserve 30% of all land and all oceans set aside by the year 2030. So that's in the next seven years, set aside for, um, for the preservation of biodiversity. CITES, that what I've just quoted, is a convention on international trade in endangered species is rep is updated frequently. Since a year ago, 2023, 40,000 species, 40,900 species are listed on the three appendices of CITES. The Ramsar Convention looks at the protection of wetlands that's been in effect since 1975. The Bonn Convention on Migratory Species has been in effect since 1983. So there are lots and lots of international conventions and so our governments are signatories to those conventions. And so we have to encourage our governments to take their, them seriously. Um, Montreal Protocol, which was last year, as I said, uh, was to set aside 30% of the earth's land and oceans by the year 2030. But size isn't everything. You can put, set aside 30% of your ocean, but the example is given of, of Mexico, just two and a half percent of Mexico, of, of the ocean around Mexico, contains one particular species. And if the Mexicans preserve that two and a half percent, then that species of now a little, a little porpoise, a little dolphin would be safe. So 30% isn't really important. For that particular species, two and a half percent of Mexico's waters would be important, would be, would be enough for them to survive. 20% of damaged ecosystems need to be restored. Um, alien species. So if I look around our garden here in Johannesburg, we've got invasive alien species. We're keeping plants, for example, like lantana, which are an invasive alien, and we're keeping them in a flower pot. And really they don't belong in South Africa. They're invasive from, North, from South America. We've got all sorts of species and wherever you live, they're invasive aliens and they should be reduced by at least 50%, because the more these alien species invade an ecosystem, the more they take space and energy and nutrients, which should be available for local species. Um, the, the ambition from Montreal is to, pro, is to fund $200 billion per year for, uh, for the preservation of biodiversity. 
I think that's a bit of a pipe dream. I think it's unlikely to happen, but that's the ambition that they that they announced at Montreal. And then there's a Congress which took place uh, earlier this month on the 15th of the 15th of May, which is about reversing the red. That means getting species out of the red danger list, getting species out of the red. And then something we can all do and we can encourage our our countries to do in Africa is to make migration corridors between various habitats. So between bits of forest, we try not to interrupt the forest completely, but allow animals to move from one part of the forest to another part of the forest, or from some part of the savanna to another part of the savanna. In Kenya, Tanzania, they're doing that very successfully for the great migration, great famous migration. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I know I've been hammering you with a lot for the last 50 minutes. Um, let me hand over to Father Flobo now. I'm going to stop screen saving here. And so we can go back to, we can go back to the normal view. Thank you very much, Nox. We, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot uh, that you've yeah. shared, and uh, it's a. I think it it boils down to this issue of Pope Francis of this complex problem that we have, which is both environmental and uh, social. And of course, if you just delve into one one part of the problem, which is biodiversity, you realize that it is extremely complex. So thank you very much for for trying to make us understand at least the complexity of this problem, ecological problem uh, related to biodiversity on this International Biodiversity Day. Uh, it was really informative and I hope uh, we all benefited from that. I wonder if there are any questions uh, to Father Peter Knox from uh, us who are listening. I I don't if have you, a question. Yes, sorry. If you could maybe uh, uh, that know, maybe if you mm -hmm. if you stop sharing the screen, stop so screen that share. we can see each other. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, maybe uh, if you can introduce yourself and uh, maybe uh, uh, before you ask your questions, uh, Meman Topi, uh, please. Uh, the floor is yours. I really not, uh, I, I don't have a question. I just want to, to thank uh, Father Knox. I'm Mantopi from Lesotho. I am a Laudado Si animator, maybe the first animator in Lesotho for Laudado Si. So I, I, I'm really happy to, to have been part of this. And I do not have que uh, questions because maybe we are doing similar work. The, the, the work that Father is doing is the work that I am also doing here, and so I really appreciate what he has um, presented to us, and it, it is actually we lost it. giving us even. Me, me Topi, sorry, we lost you there. I think there was there was a bit of uh, silence, or was it only on my side? I was hearing her fine. Do you, do you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. No, I, I, I was actually saying that I am only grateful to have been part of this presentation and it has given me more light to help me do my own advocacy here on policy implementation because that's the challenge that we have. Since this morning, I've been having on different platforms a similar presentation in a shorter form to say how do we raise awareness and so I, I i only want to say that i'm grateful for that that that, that was really brilliant and informative thank you so much <clears throat> uh, i don't thank know you, if Mantel. there's any other any other question for the notes yeah. yes uh, ruben please don't forget to introduce yourself and uh, before you ask your question. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Ruben from the Jesuit Center for Ecology and Development in Malawi. Um, first of all, thank you 
uh, for this presentation. I listened to it yesterday and I, you know, repetition is very ignition. So <laughs> I true. listened to it again today and I got more interesting insight. Uh, what I can say is a lot of thought provoking. It was a very thought provoking um, presentation, particularly on the issue of biodiversity hotspots. I think that's one one part that caught my attention. Um, here in Malawi, for instance, we have Lake Malawi, and Lake Malawi is a very unique lake. It's a freshwater lake, and it has got a lot of uh, species that are very unique uh, to the lake. Uh, at the moment, they say there are about 400 and 50, 458 species, but the scientists say that actually there may be up to 2,000 species which are unique. So you can see that this, this, this lake, for instance, is a, a global biodiversity treasure. Uh, but at the same time, there are some species that are endangered. Uh, you talk of, uh, we have chambo, for instance, which is a, a delicacy here. And uh, so it poses a challenge because here a lot of people depend on fish, for instance, it's the main source of protein. And at the same time, uh, there's a pressure on the... So in my wild thinking, I was thinking maybe this is one of the areas that we can think of uh, working. Uh, maybe if we can work on making this place a biodiversity hotspot, because that creates an opportunity for... Um, funding and attention to to the um, uh, conservation efforts. Um, so that's that's one thing that uh, really was going on in my mind when uh, the presentation was going on. Other than that, I can I can say that really loss of biodiversity is a big challenge here um, in, in in Malawi, and uh, it's affecting a lot in terms of. Uh, agriculture because the economy of Malawi is agro-based. Um, so one of the things that I, on the, on the challenges uh, for biodiversity loss, I noticed that um, there was no mention of natural disasters or maybe it was in, indirectly mentioned in the other causes. It can fall under climate change, for instance, because some of these um, disasters, natural disasters are linked to climate change and the, yeah, but natural disasters are causing a lot of biodiversity loss in Malawi. For instance, if you go to the site that was affected by the cyclone, you find an entire village was white. So you, you, you go to the place and they tell you that here there used to be a trading center, there used to be a forest here, there used to be fields. But what you see now, you just see rocks and mud. The, everything is gone. So, and that's not just, that's just not one place. You have several places where that has happened. A whole village swept and you have people died and animals and everything. So I think that's one of the, if, um, the challenges uh, to biodiversity that we are beginning to experience uh, with the recurring of the cyclones in this part of the world. And um, I think when we think of relief, for instance, to disasters, what we think of is the people that are affected. We want to give them houses. We want to give them food. But we don't think, I think, very much about restoring the biodiversity that has been lost lost due to the, to the natural disasters. I think that's also one of the areas that we can work on as a center we can think of say when there's a natural disaster that has happened people have lost lives livelihoods but there's also a biodiversity loss uh, that has happened how can we maybe as part of the restorative efforts we should think of also um, restoring the the biodiversity that was uh, lost and um, looking at climate change as a loss of biodiversity, but uh, I think biodiversity now becomes part of the solution to climate change, because if we talk of climate change uh, causing intense heat, we know that biodiversity through 
trees, for instance, they can help in that. Uh, but also, I think for us, we 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 should we we can focus, for instance, on small efforts through the projects that we are engaged in. At the moment, for instance, we have a project of uh, promoting victory gardens, and these victory gardens they are backyard gardens which do not just grow one particular crop. You have several types of uh, crops and the several type of crops, they play different roles. For instance, instead of uh, using chemicals for pesticides, you plant pepper or any of those type of uh, crops that protect. So they don't kill the pests because the, the pests, they, even though we view them as pests to the garden, but they play a vital role in the wider uh, ecosystem. So those type of small efforts, uh, I think, but otherwise, uh, this was a very thought provoking uh, presentation. Uh, I think we'll, we'll keep on going back to it and then seeing what more we can do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you, Ruben. Uh, uh, I think, yeah, you've raised very important points and uh, particularly this one of natural disasters, which I think you're right. And, and of course, JCED, you've got a lot of experience working with these, uh, uh, with the communities that were affected by the natural disasters. Uh, so you, you, I suppose you're talking from experience and what you have seen on the ground with your team there uh, when you were helping those communities that were affected by these uh, cyclones. So uh, there are interesting points there that you raised and uh, we look forward to see JCED uh, uh, responding to those uh, challenges. Unfortunately, I wanted to ask Mantopi if, the, if she could share with us what is happening in Lesotho. Unfortunately, she has left us before we could uh, get that chance. That chance. Daniel Knox, I don't know if you want to comment on uh, what has been said so far. Um, I, I really took Ruben's point seriously about Lake Malawi. As, as he said, there are 2,000, possibly 2,000 species, many of them tilapia, which occur nowhere else in the world. And so it's a really, it's a real biodiversity hotspot. There's a difficulty there because it's between two countries, um, Zambia, Malawi, I think even Tanzania shares part of the border of Lake Malawi. And so, so, um, funding would have to come in and it would have to be shared in a way that that makes it possible for all the various parts of the lake to be properly preserved. There's a danger of over-exploitation, as, as uh, Ruben has said, that some species are being particularly sought after because they're delicacies. Um, lake Malawi is, is known also as a birding hotspot. Uh, many, many birds kind of stop off on their migration route down to South Africa, they stop off at Lake Malawi just to recharge and to refuel before they come further south to to their wintering grounds or as far as we're concerned, their summering grounds. Um, I wonder whether natural disasters are really as natural as we think they are. Um, that cyclone or the cyclones that have hit Malawi, Mozambique, Zimbabwe in the last couple of years, in the last three years, are they really natural? Are they really human generated? I mean, ultimately, we have to say that climate change is a is a human um, is largely, not exclusively, human induced, and therefore the effects of climate change, the extreme weather events, are they natural events or are they not? Um, a natural event, I would think, is something like an earthquake or a volcano, which don't seem to have human causes, but cyclones, um, droughts, and things like that relate specifically to climate or to weather events. And yeah, that's, so it's just, it's a question of terminology, but I, I think it's an interesting one. I see that Mantopi has returned, Dadis Lovo. Hey, yes. Um, that's true. Um, Mantopi, uh, we were just talking about you now, saying, uh, maybe, I don't know, I mean, we've had what uh, uh, Ruben shared with us about the situation in Malawi. I don't know if you have anything to say to us about Lesotho, uh, 
uh, with regards to biodiversity or issues of climate. You know, you said you are a laureate of sea animator. Uh, maybe, if is there anything that you can share with us, please? If if anything. Okay, that I I can only quickly say that um, the biodiversity loss is a problem that we also have. And um, in one of the groups that we have been discussing this issue this morning, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 there was this that Basoto, as you have rightly uh, presented, that um, we are using some of the plants for medicine. Then it says that when we are losing and when people are not educated or when we have not really raised enough. Um, awareness and not made people part of the plan, then we, we are losing biodiversity in the way that we do, where people will take spades and all that to, to dig out everything we, we, with the roots. This is the challenge that we are having. And we, 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 we realize that, as maybe Ruben was saying, that some of the disasters are also caused by loss of biodiversity because we have taken everything on our landscapes, everything is there. There's nothing that can hold the soils and anymore. So it, it, it's really a challenge that we also have. But then what we are trying to do also here is, is to say, as Pope Francis rightly indicates, as um, Father Knox was presenting in that chapter on biodiversity laws, it, it, it's really, it's actually, the responsibility also of us as Christians uh, to, to so how do we it doesn't seem like we are part of the plan so that is a lot there's a lot of awareness that we also have to to raise on the side of the church or on us as Christians to say how do we relate all this loss of biodiversity to our our own responsibility of co-creation and so that's that, that that's what I would say that we, we, we have similar challenges as everybody also has. Maybe in the Sotu we even have even greater challenges because yeah, you, you for people who know Lesotho being a mountainous um country, if it loses biodiversity, then we are in trouble and we already feel that we are in trouble. I, that, that's all I can say. I, I only understand that related to the theme of this year, we also have a greater responsibility to raise awareness uh, also in our, in our churches to connect our faith with the plan of God. And because being part of the plan to save biodiversity is part of God's plan. So we, we we just have to remain co-creators and then make everybody to be part of this plan. Okay. No, Rale thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the sharings. Uh, I don't know if we, we've reached the 11.30 mark, uh, the end of our uh, allotted time for this webinar. Maybe... Uh, Dada Knox, uh, I wonder if you have any parting shots and... Uh, 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 yeah. yeah, I I thank you very much, Mayor Mantopi. Um, many, many years ago, Father Slobo and I went on a holiday in Lesotho. We were riding pony back up in the mountains, quite high in the Maluti. And I was privileged, I was very fortunate enough to see a bird that occurs only in the Maluti and the Drakensberg, so on the South Africa and Lesotho sides of the border. And there's the, even the grasslands of Lesotho have very, very specific endemic species which occur nowhere else in the world. Um, some of, one of them is threatened. For example, it's known as Boerter's Lark, I think. It's threatened because those highland grasslands are being overexploited by cattle. And but this, this one called the rock jumper occurs also only in Lesotho and the South African side of the border of the same mountains. And so a small country like Lesotho, you've also got a very important role to play in maintaining and preserving biodiversity. 
it's been a pleasure to speak to all of you. I wish we'd have, I wish we'd have more time together. I wish we'd had people to share with us, but this presentation will be available in the next couple of days on the website of, of the, on the YouTube site of the Jesuit Institute in South Africa. Thanks for the floor. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And as you can see on the on the chat box, they have put the link to the uh, YouTube channel of the Jesuit Institute, where this uh, uh, recording will be posted in in a few days' time. And we thank you for your time, and we have a, we wish you a very wonderful uh, international uh, day of biodiversity. Let us continue the good work. And uh, hopefully we'll have time to chat more uh, again in the future about these important matters. God bless and have a blessed day. Bye. Thank you, mate.